Hey, welcome to the PTL overview series from Juno to Kilo. We started this series so that we can do an extension from the summit where the PTL share our product project updates. Today we have Owen Glenn, David Lyle, and John Dickinson sharing their project updates. And we're going to go ahead and start with Owen Glenn who will provide updates on telemetry. So Owen, if you're ready. Thanks, Alison. Um, I'll take it away. Basically, I'm going to provide I'm the Salometer PTL, as Alan, as Alison said, and I'm going to provide a, an update on what we're planning to do over the Kilo release cycle. So, next slide, please. We'll start with uh, just a little reminder. Um, and on slide two, I've got the mission statement that we agreed with the. Uh, with the technical committee over the previous cycle. And this provides uh, you know, a, a fairly terse um, kind of a summary of what we're all about in Salometer. So I've kind of divided it up there in the slide and the, the kind of the three phases of what we do. So the, <clears throat> the purpose really is to surface insight into what's going on in your cloud. In order to do that, we need to collect measurements basically of how the, the physical and virtual resources that comprise your deployed cloud, and how they, these are being used, how they're performing, who's actually using them. And then these data once collected, obviously, you know, in order for them to be put to use later on down the line, we need to persist these data so they can be subsequently retrieved and, and analyzed. And also, we need to be able to trigger actions when some defined criteria are met. And a really good example um, of, of that would be heat auto scaling. So basically, heat auto scaling is a mechanism whereby um, the, the content or the, the membership of a group of instances can be dynamically adjusted according to the trend in usage that's observed um, of those instances. And that's an example of where an action has been triggered by some data collection that Salometer um, is doing. And then the actual triggering of the action is, is, is basically driven by a feature of Salometer um, called alarming. So moving on to, to slide three, that's basically our, our mission. And the next thing really is how are we applying this mission over the period of the Juno release cycle? Well, here are the things um, on slide three. I've given a kind of a high-level laundry list of the things that we spent our time in Paris talking about when we weren't doing touristic stuff. We weren't um, traveling around looking at the Eiffel Tower much. Um, most of it was spent uh, in deep conversation in conclave where we discussed basically our plans for the, the upcoming Kilo release cycle and came out with, with these set of prioritized teams that we're going to attack over, over the um, over the next six months. So the, the, the highest priority thing and the, the thing that we're really focusing on is completion of this new time series data as a service, the Noki project we're calling it, and the migration of Salometer to use that as its metric storage layer. So that's really going to consume a lot of our attention. And basically, it's been a multi-cycle effort. I'm going to talk in detail as to what it comprises, why we're doing it, uh, what the status is, and, and what the, 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 the remaining work looks like over Kilo. Um, but in addition to that, we've got, we've got other parallel efforts going on. And I'm going to provide a little bit of detail on, on each of these um, on this update. Now, one thing that, that's um, quite important that's happening across the board in, over Kilo in, um, in OpenStack is the idea of taking a lot of test coverage that was previously provided by Tempest, which is an integration and test suite that, that spins up a lot of services and it tests a lot of interactions between those services, moving a lot of that coverage so that it's now within the individual trees of the individual services. And with some other planned testing improvements as well that fall under that category of providing the right kind of test coverage. And um, I'll, I'll give a bit um, more detail on that in, in, in a few minutes. The other thing we want to do is to basically make the segregation between tenants and the role-based access control in effect to make that configuration richer and more flexible in Salometer. Um, we want to reach a point in time at which the notifications that the other services emit, services such as um, Nova, Glance, Neutron, Keystone, etc., those notifications are currently consumed by um, Salometer. And we want to basically 
allow that notification-based interaction to become as contract-based and as stable as a, as a true API. So um, that will require some work both on the consumer side, in consumers such as Solometer and also related projects such as, say, StackDAC, but also a lot of change on the emitter side. So that, that's a, a very significant piece of work, and it's something that's been mooted many times. It's been kind of oft discussed but never actually delivered upon. So what we're really trying to do over Kilo is, is finally put that issue to bed and finally basically promote notification-based interactions so that they're kind of like first-class citizens in the open stack world. We have a number of um, improvements uh, on our roster around deployment flexibility. So ways in which the complexity of actually deploying a um, solometer, uh, the set of solometer agents over a you know non-trivial um, deployment of OpenStack, not just a you know a single node POC or something small like that, and um, how that that um, flexibility can be improved and the complexity reduced. Uh, we also have uh, a few improvements around how we process events. So currently, Solometer basically has two different ways on which data can be acquired. One is a kind of a, an act of going out and grabbing that data, a kind of a, a polling model, and the other is more passive, kind of sitting back and, and allowing the services to tell us what's going on via um, notifications that are delivered over the Oslo messaging bus. And we've got a number of, of ways of improving how we actually process those notifications. And lastly, um, I've got a, a, um, a line item that's, that's kind of much, pretty much assigned to me, and that's collaboration with a very interesting and related project in the OpenStack ecosystem called Manaska. So Manaska are all about monitoring at a very large scale. It's uh, a project that grew out of an effort within HP uh, and now involves contributions from several different um, large OpenStack um, companies, including IBM and Rackspace. And you know, they're, they're somewhat complementary to what Solometer does, but also um, you know, there, there, there's some commonality there as well. And we're going to explore how we can kind of uh, collaborate with the Manaska folks and, and you know, where, where our interests align basically achieve things together. So let's drill down uh, in a bit more detail into each of these themes. So firstly, this time series data as a service, this Noki project, what's it all about? So first to recap, this is actually uh, very similar to a slide that I used in the PTL update for Juno. Um, and basically, I'm just recapping what Noki is all about. So the goal here is to provide efficient metric storage. So you may well ask the question, well, Solometer is obviously involved in storing metrics currently. Um, is that inherently inefficient? Well, there's a couple of kind of uh, drawbacks to the approach that Solometer currently takes. And one of those is the fact that we snapshot resource metadata alongside each individual data point that we store. Now, that provides an awful lot of flexibility, and it also provides a very good record of the evolution of the resource state, the timeline of that evolution. But the downside is that much of this metadata is either static or very rarely changing. So there's much more efficient ways of storing this near static information than continually snapshotting it alongside each, um, each individual data point. Um, the other thing that we, we, we want to change, we want to kind of upend the approach is Solometer, as classic Solometer to coin a phrase, is predicated on this idea of all aggregation being done on, on demand. If you issue a statistics query and you have a certain uh, bucketization that you want, for example, per hour, that um, aggregation is done on demand, on the fly, for each individual query. And if the same query is emitted a second later, it's, it's, it's done again. So what we want to do is shift to a model whereby we eagerly pre-aggregate and roll up these data as they're being ingested. So that's the, those are the key differences, really, between how um, we view this time series data as a service playing out. It's been um, implemented uh, initially at arm's length from Solometer via a project that was um, spun up on Stackforge by my predecessor, Julien Donjou, my predecessor as, as PTL of the Solometer project. And it was envisaged from the get-go as kind of a multi-cycle effort that, we would, um, that would play out over Juno and Kilo. And that we get to a point uh, at the conclusion of Kilo whereby we were ready to migrate um, Solometer core to using Noki as its primary metric storage layer. So currently, um, 
there is a canonical analytics and, and storage engine provided by Noki, which is based on the Pandas analytics library. It's a commonly used analytics, data analytics library in, in uh, Python and using Swift as the storage backend. But our intent is to um, also provide alternative storage drivers. So we follow the standard OpenSAC pluggable model. And the idea is that we'll have alternative drivers based on other specialized metrics-oriented databases such as InfluxDB and OpenTSDB. They're, those are the two that we're currently actively working on. So that's kind of a, a recap of you know, where Noki came from. So where is it at currently? What's the status? So moving on to slide five, um, I've listed there basically just a, a kind of a laundry list of the, what we've achieved so far and what's currently in flight as far as, as um, you know, fairly coarse-grained functional areas are, of Nokia are concerned. So completed, um, we've got the Core Metrics and Resources API. Um, so it's a, a REST API in the, in the typical um, OpenStack style. And basically, it's going to form the kernel of the V3 Solometer API. We also have a single storage driver that's completely built out that's based on Pandas and Swift, as I said. We've also got the aggregation model and a policy-based model that determines what um, level of aggregation and how the roll-up occurs for, for each individual metric. It's a, it's a fairly rich model because you can um, attach different policies to, to different metrics and have different levels of expiry and time to live related to different metrics. We've got a dispatch mechanism in place within the Solometer Collector service. And this is an API-based model. And by that, I mean that the dispatcher uses the REST API to push the metric data points up to the time series, as a, as a, the time series data as a service um, API. And, and the intent basically was for that to be the, the kind of proof of concept, the proof that you know, Solometer data could be stored and retrieved um, from this new Noki service. But um, as, as I'll, I'll, I'll mention later, we've got an alternative, more efficient um, dispatch model in mind where the Noki storage driver effectively runs in process within the Solometer collector service. And we also have the Keystone integration piece all done. So the, you know, the typical kind of um, uh, call out to the authentication layer, and also the um, out-of-the-box uh, role-based access control policies. Now in progress, we've got our two alternative storage drivers. One is based on OpenTSDB, which is a, a moderately widely used um, metrics-oriented database that's based on HBase, so it's a type of thing that one would run over an Hadoop cluster. And then also InfluxDB, which is a very interesting um, database that's implemented in Golang that, um, you know, it, it's again uh, specialized for metric storage and provides native features around downsampling of, of, um, of uh, data points and is, is, is highly optimized for this particular type of um, storage problem. We've got uh, some logic around custom aggregation whereby you can have pluggable components that basically uh, provide additional aggregation logic. So clearly we're going to have our, our basic um, aggregation functions uh, defined, things like maximum, minima, and averages, and sums, and counts, and even more exotic things like um, standard deviations. But sometimes you want, to, you want to go even further than that. So we've got a custom aggregation layer uh, in, in progress being implemented, and a number of an example uh, applications of this, including moving averages and also host winters and uh, forecasting. Um, another thing that's in progress that's, that's quite interesting and will be crucial for our alarming integration is the ability to do cross-entity aggregation. So by that I mean the ability to aggregate data points that have originated from different resources. So you can say either give me the CPU utilization for this individual instance or else give me the average CPU utilization over a group of related instances. For example, the instances that make up a, um, an auto-scaling group as defined by heat. Um, and lastly there, we've got, a, which I mentioned earlier, we've got in progress an effort towards providing an alternative dispatch model from the Solometer Collector Service that's basically in-processed as opposed to uh, API-based. So in that case, the collector would lo load the Noki storage driver and 
call out directly to InfluxDB or Pandas plus Swift or OpenTSDB or whatever it is, as opposed to making a direct invocation on the REST API. So that's kind of where we're at as far as Nokia is concerned. So what, what additional work have we planned for, for, for Kilo? So basically, our key and um, our the crucial things that need to be achieved before we can declare victory on this. We need to recast the V2 query API, which um, allows you to basically slice and dice um, salometer data in many different ways. We need to recast that over Doki semantics so that it takes account of the restrictions that would be imposed by this model of not snapshotting resource metadata for each individual and um, sample data point. And remember, Having putting that restriction in place is key to making the um, salometer uh, metric storage strategy, making that massively scalable. We also need to rebase the salometer alarm evaluation uh, logic on the V3 metrics API. So this will be effectively the, the retrieval API that, that Noki um, supports. We need to provide a logic to allow customers to take pre-existing um, metering stores. So a customer, for example, or a user who basically had a deployment of Salometer running for some time and was using the classic Salometer uh, storage um, layer, we need some way of capturing that data and basically extracting it and distilling it and basically presenting it up then as um, equivalent data to the way uh, Nokia actually stores in pre-aggregated rolled up form. And lastly, in order to, uh, I suppose, make clear the benefits of, of using this alternative storage strategy, we're, we've already done quite a lot of profiling and we have a lot of uh, potential optimization that we're going to attack over Kilo. And finally, we're going to publish all of these results and indicate the, the, the potential benefits so that people are very sure before they, they switch from classic salometer to using the Noki storage and layer as an alternative. Now, of course, the classic salometer way of doing things will be maintained on a deprecation path. Um, the standard in OpenStack would be for something like this to maintain for at least two cycles going forward. So it's not something that we're going to pull the rug under, out from under um, existing Salometer users. Uh, there will be a, you know, a long transitionary phase, and, and basically people will be given plenty of notice. But of course, it's always good to have a very solid case for uh, early adopters to move forward. And that's what we intend this, this detailed performance prof profiling and effort to, to provide. So in addition to that, we've got a bunch of other parallel efforts that are, that are unrelated to the, um, the Noki project. Um, I spoke about these in, in fairly broad terms. I'll give a, a little bit more detail now. So in terms of testing, what do we want to move to? Well, we want to uh, follow the, the trend that's, that's happening right across OpenStack of moving a lot of our coverage out from this kind of global uh, Tempest test suite into functional tests that are more directly associated with our project um, repo. So we're calling these in-tree functional tests in the sense that they, they, they live alongside the actual code that's been tested in, in, in the same Git repository. And this will allow us basically to not be as restricted in terms of how these integrated integration tests are actually constructed. So uh, you know, a, a good Tempest test is, is, a, is a pure black box test. It doesn't assume anything about the um, underpinning implementation. Whereas we want to be able to test things in more of a kind of a, a gray box method. We want to be able to make assumptions about the internal implementation. We want to be able to write tests that do things like accelerate the metrics gathering cadence that Salometer uses so that the, the test can complete in, in a reasonable time. So we want to, for example, change uh, you know, some configuration option that causes some salometer agent to um, gather data points at a, at, a, at a much faster rate than it normally does, and then uh, make some kind of assertions around the metric data points that have been gathered, and do that all within a reasonable time. We also want to basically produce a set, a set of, of API tests that are much more declarative in form, that, form, that basically provide kind of du dual duty um, such that you could read the tests. They're unencumbered by lots of um, complex Python code. And instead, as well as providing test coverage, provide a, you know, an almost organic form of documentation of how the API is intended to actually be used 
and you know how it how the, the the form of of requests and responses, but in a, in a very kind of high level and digestible form. And lastly, we want to use um, the Rally test framework to basically introduce scenario tests. So these are tests that basically in induce some workload over Solometer and then basically measure the results in effect. And that will basically allow us to, to measure performance improvements uh, in a very convenient way and also allow us to, to basically watch out for performance degradations where they occur and to catch those early. Another area that we're going to dig into is this whole uh, configuration of segregation between tenants. So up to now, there's been a kind of an all or nothing model in Solometer between um, basically users who have, have the admin role and users who are non-admin. So admin users can see all. They're omniscient. They basically, everything is visible to them uh, as far as Solometer is concerned, whereas normal users can only see the data and can only reason over that data and alarm on that data associated with the, the resources that they themselves own. So that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's useful in terms of, of um, tenant segregation, but it's, it's very kind of um, absolute, it, uh, whereas we want to have a much more kind of nuanced model and use the role-based access control mechanism that um, OpenStack provides and basically to start leveraging the more forward-looking um, features of Keystone, including this idea of domains. So this notion that the administrative role isn't something necessarily global, but it's something that can be uh, partitioned between different related groups of users um, via, via this notion of domains. We have a number of different uh, improvements around deployment flexibility. So we're going to merge our very simple, uh, our very similar central and compute agents so that we have a single polling agent that can be run in, in a similar mode to the current central agent or compute agent or can do dual duty. And that will make um, small deployments more simple. We want to basically be able to centralize the storage of the pipeline configuration, which is currently stored in a flat file that needs to be rolled out to each individual node. It's the pipeline that YAML, that existing Solometer users would uh, know and love. And we want to basically allow that to be centrally stored so that it can be changed in a, in a, in a more global fashion um, across uh, large deployments. And we also want to, uh, one thing that, another thing that will make deployment simpler is this idea of allowing the metrics gathering uh, over SNMP to be truly declarative, to be driven by config, so that you can decide which SNMP metrics you're interested in and change those on the fly very easily. Um, some other parallel efforts, uh, we want notifications that are emitted by services such as Nova, Neutron, Glance, etc. to be, I mean currently these are essentially just freeform dic dictionaries. Uh, there's no contract involved, there's no stability. So we want to uh, go ahead and schematize all of those and we're doing that as a joint effort with um, some folks from the, the StackDAC project which is a, a related project in the uh, OpenStack ecosystem that's also alongside Solometer probably the primary consumer of notifications. We're going to improve our events pipeline so that the events database is completely split off from the uh, metrics database so you can decide to store your events for example in Mongo and store your um, data points, for example, in Noki or in HBase or wherever, you know, any of the other storage drivers that are supported by Solometer. And we're also going to use the same model of coordination between scaled out notification agents. This is the agent in Solometer that's responsible for consuming events as we currently use for the central agent and the compute agent where we want to um, provide a kind of a mutually exclusive partitioning between individual um, agents such that they don't step on each other's toes and they don't duplicate work, but yet um, no work also falls through the cracks. And that can be done in a way that takes account of the fact that the, the pool of currently running agents can change over time. And lastly, we've got a couple of um, line items around collaboration with the related Manaska project. So I'm currently working on um, figuring out if we can uh, reuse or leverage somehow their uh, anomaly detection engine, which is a very interesting component in Manaska that we don't have a, a direct analog of in Solometer. We both have a common concern around InfluxDB. Uh, they're using InfluxDB as a, one of their um, storage options, and we also intend to do so for NoKeep. So we have common concerns, for example, around getting influx into the continuous integration gate upstream. And lastly, um, Manaska are using Apache Kafka um, as their kind of high throughput uh, internal messaging bus. And that's something that, that, that Solometer could learn from. We, we use uh, Oslo messaging both for external and internal messaging. And basically, uh, Apache Kafka provides several kind of benefits around um, throughput and um, scale, et cetera. So uh, 
just my, my final slide here is just emphasizing the point that uh, we're available for um, you guys to, you know, anyone who has any further questions or wants to kind of uh, any more depth on any of these topics to reach out either on IRC, on our hash OpenStack Salometer channel, or you can, you can ping me directly over IRC on eglin at, at Freenode. And my home time zone is GMT, so you know, take that into account if you're, if you're wanting to chat over, over IRC. We have our weekly meeting at 1500 UTC on a Thursday, so you can join that if you want to if you want to go deeper with any of these discussions. And of course, we've got the OpenStack Dev and mailing list. So that kind of concludes my uh, my update um, for Solometer. So I'll, I'll I'll hand the the, the conch back to Allison at this point. Fantastic. Thank you, Owen, for providing those updates. And I'll also include his contact information in the description below. So again, feel free to reach out to him at any time if you do have any questions. All right, next we have David Lyle on the line who will provide updates on Horizon. Great. Thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's just start with uh, this is going to be the Horizon Cube update. I'm David Lyle on the OpenStack Dashboard PTL. Um, I just want to start off with, you can go to the next slide. So I just want to start out, like a lot of these, reminding what, what our mission statement is in Horizon, basically uh, to provide an extensible unified web-based user interface for all integrated OpenStack services. So we want to be a, a unified uh, user interface for all the OpenStack services that are, part of, that are integrated into the release. Um, obviously with the big tent discussions, that scope may creep out a little bit, but um, for now that's, that's still the still the range of, of what we're trying to accomplish. And then the other big item is we want to be extensible. So we realize that uh, we can't deliver all, all functionality that you would need to operate a cloud uh, or provide your end users via Horizon. Um, every cloud I know of runs other extensions, other things that they'd want to manage. So we want to be able to have that extension mechanism so that, so that when you go and set up a cloud, then you, you can plug in um, other functionality in Horizon. So just a little re recap on Juno. Uh, some of the big additions were uh, support for Sahara. Uh, Sahara came out of or was added to the integrated release in Juno. Um, we have rich support for um, creating clusters, creating jobs to run on those clusters, um, to do MapReduce and other uh, other data processing operations. Um, so that was a big addition for us in Sahara. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of functionality there, uh, and I encourage people to check it out. Um, better plugin support. Uh, we had a primitive plugin support uh, mechanism uh, that we added in late Ice House. Um, in Juno, we fleshed that out a little bit better, um, allowing you to pull in um, more of your static files, things like JavaScript, um, images, um, other things that um, make allow you to do a, a f more full-featured extension. Um, this also helps operators move away from the model where uh, basically you'd have to pull down the Horizon uh, repo and then hack the code inside of Horizon to extend it. That's really not a, a great model for, for anybody who's trying to deploy code and then keep it up to date with trunks. So we've, we've been working hard to provide a better mechanism. Um, the next item that we, we did was UX updates. So we, we kind of locked into some older technology, um, some older versions of Bootstrap for uh, our styling and, and JavaScript and other things. Um, we finally got past that uh, so we can be a lot more, pull in a lot of the bug fixes from upstream, a lot of the styling improvements, a lot of the UX improvements. Um, so now we're, we're currently up to date with Bootstrap and a lot of the other underlying libraries that we uh, were dependent upon. Um, and so that's been a great, great step forward. Uh, the last big thing I'd like to point out is um, Lance added the um, metadata catalog concept in the Juno release, and Horizon provides support for um, both viewing and updating metadata properties on uh, things like images and volumes and post aggregates. Um, and so we provided a nice widget for that, and um, that functionality was added in Juno. Uh, there'll be a, there'll be further enhancements of that in Juno. 
Uh, so what's next on the, on the deck for Kilo? So the, the first item is going to be uh, support for Ironic. So Ironic graduated um, in, the, in the old mechanism. Again, with the big tent model, things may change. But we plan on supporting Ironic in the Kilo time frame, um, both for end users and also for operators. So um, end users will have the option um, when interacting with Nova to set up uh, a bare metal instance rather than uh, They'll have that option, and then operators as well to um, both, you know, specify new nodes and then bring them in um, and allocate them. Um, so at the summit, we spent a lot of time talking about how we were going to provide better user experience going forward. Um, that's been a big focus of of mine since I, I became PPL, and trying to take Horizon and make it a lot more user friendly. Um, and so. About a release ago, we decided to, to start moving towards Angular JS as, as a more of a client-side architecture. Um, the reasoning behind that is just to provide um, better feedback to users um, quicker. Uh, try not to do so much data loading on each request. Um, so push a lot more of the, of the UI onto the client side, cache data there, um, and be able to do, operate on a lot more data um, on, and provide that information back to the user a lot quicker. So in Kilo, one of the first things we're going to do is work on a, a reference implementation for how, how Horizon is going to move forward in this transition. Um, or the focus of this will be on the identity dashboards, uh, or identity dashboards, so panels like projects and users. Um, and when you bring in Keystone v3, you'll get groups and roles um, and domains. And so this basically will use that uh, as a way to set up um, the reference implementation for going forward on how we're going to use Angular um, and and how, other, how others can use it in extensions going forward as well. Um, part of the improved user experience effort that we were working on is improving the table experience. Uh, so right now, the state of the each service has slightly or has different APIs and. Horizon kind of thinly represents that API to the user via a, a list or a table. Um, so the filtering's inconsistent currently. Um, pagination is inconsistent. Um, the different APIs do different things with pagination. They provide different filters, um, different ways to search, essentially. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to move a lot of that onto the client side as well. We're going to try and uh, cache a bit more data on the client and provide the pagination and the filtering um, in the horizon code rather than relying on the APIs to do it. Um, in, in that way, we can um, provide a consistent user experience. So the user doesn't have to guess if they're, if they're moving through the horizon UI and, and, and landing on a new page and trying to figure out what, what the paradigm is for this page. Um, so again, this is, this is just trying to improve the user experience um, put more information at the user's fingertips and allow them to uh, find data a lot more quickly and, uh, and, and accomplish the task that they're trying to do. Um, uh, additionally, as part of the user experience, so we implemented a wizard. Uh, I believe that was back in late Havana. Um, I felt it kind of sat stagnant as we were trying to move forward. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a primitive wizard. Um, uh, so a step, um, a step workflow essentially. Um, we're going to refocus on that in this release. Part of that is with the Angular implementation. So um, in, in this release, we'd like to get the launch instance workflow or uh, wizard um, greatly improved. Um, that's one of the biggest usability issues with Horizon right now is that the launch instance uh, workflow is just very confusing. Um, requires a lot of knowledge up front. Um, so we're going to try. We've been working with uh, the OpenStack UX team um, for the past release, essentially uh, on design uh, to to get a better workflow on that and, and move forward. Um, as part of that, th that will be implemented on, on the client side as well. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that we're not kind of Painting ourselves into a corner on the implementation, so we're going to we're going to do the network wizard as well, um, just to make sure that we have a an extensible format, extensible widget 
on the client side that that we can uh, reuse. We're going to continue to refine the plugin support. As I said before, it's really important that we have a clean plugin mechanism um, that doesn't involve editing the source code in the Horizon repo in any way or the Horizon package when it gets shipped. Um, right now, the plugin mechanism does require you to, to add files um, into the directory where Horizon gets deployed. Obviously, that's, that's not... <laughs> And that's not optimal, uh, and it causes a lot of problems um, when you want to go and update a package if you're doing it with a with a with a systems packaging system. Um, so we're going to continue to refine that so that it's um, you can point to where that plugin mechanism is um, again, and then we're going to have to refine it a little bit to provide better Angular support as well as we as we're moving more in that direction. Uh, better theming. So another big concern um, for operators is that um, they don't want to sh ship Horizon looking <laughs> the same as everybody else's UI, um, especially if you're putting it in front of customers um, or you're wanting to do re uh, reseller models. Um, it, it, we need to be able to theme it better, and we need to be able to do that without hacking into the Horizon code as well. Um, so the goal for this is we we started down this road. Um, we started pulling out the appropriate variables that uh, for coloring and, and some size that, uh, that operators would want to change to change the look and feel. Um, we're going to continue going down that road and, and, and provide a hopefully a much better uh, theming mechanism that um, is a lot easier to leverage. Uh, federation and single sign-on. So we're working with the Keystone team to provide federated authentication. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of corporations that use OpenStack have, a, have an authentication backend already uh, where all the users are set up. Um, they don't want to have to pull that into Keystone, or all that user information into Keystone. They don't want to have to um, dupl du duplicate all that. So we want to provide the federation uh, a mechanism to do that federated logon. Um, come along with that come single sign on where um, if you're authenticate hopefully if you're authenticated into your corporate uh, authorization system already then once you come when you come to horizon you wouldn't have to reauthenticate uh, multi domain identity operations so um, Keystone v three has been out <laughs> since uh, in savannah actually uh, it may yeah I think it's savannah uh, there's support for multiple domains in there. Uh, we support that to a degree in Horizon. We need to do a much better job. Um, part of that is you want to have a much richer uh, set of roles than um, admin and, and member um, to do these operations. You want to have, say, a domain admin. Um, we can't really support that right now because we don't, um, they don't interact with Keystone the right way. So we're going to tackle um, adding that support in this release. So that should provide, this will be a step forward also on the uh, hierarchical multi-tenancy path um, at the Keystone implementing in Kilo. Um, so this work will be leveraged in that as well as what's already there in Keystone V3. Um, another big thing that we've been pushing on for a couple cycles is getting integration tests going. Um, so for a long time, Horizon had, had uh, just just unit tests. Um, we had one integration test that ran in Tempest. Uh, it still does, actually. Um, but we've been working um, heavily on trying to get an integration test suite set up uh, and going. And so we actually have we have quite a few uh, integration tests that run against the Horizon gate jobs now. They're not they're not configured as part of Tempest because um, we're still trying to work through the kinks and, and uh, get it more full-featured, but uh, that, I think we'll be ready with that at the end of Kilo to um, be able to run all the gating jobs, at least for Horizon against this. And that is all I had for uh, Kilo. We'll continue to finish fleshing out API support, so um, Horizon has 
pretty good API support across OpenStack, but there, there are certainly parts of the API that we don't represent. Um, and as, as services move forward um, with the versions of the APIs and, and adding uh, features, obviously we like to pick those up as, long, as well as we move along. So um, that will also be, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a consistent focus of ours is, is to try and remain in sync with the other services. Um, and you feel free to contact me on uh, freenode IRC at David and Lyle, um, or you can email me at David dot lyle at intel dot com. Um, any, any, uh, we have weekly team meetings. The, the times oscillate, so uh, it's best to check out the OpenStack meetings page if you'd like to to uh, join in and, and provide some feedback or ask questions. I'll send it back to Alton. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, David, and thank you again for your time today and providing your Kilo updates. Um, next, and last but not least, we have John Dickinson, who is going to be sharing his um, updates on SWIFT. Hello. Thank you for having me. These things are always, a fun, always fun for me to do. Uh, I love the summit timeframes when we're talking about summaries of what's going on because it gets a chance to see exactly what's uh, reflect on what's uh, happened and how we can go forward from here. So my name is John Dickinson. Uh, I am not my name on IRC and Twitter, and I am the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, which is the object storage component of OpenStack. The background image that I chose here is one of the international prototypes for the kilogram. And the, the principal one is stored near Paris. And so since the summit was there, that's what we named the next integrated release in OpenStack. Uh, we, we called it the Kilo release uh, after, after that uh, international standard that is stored near Paris. So I think that was a kind of a, a cool choice, and I, I really liked that. And I, and I think it actually reflects a little bit of what's going on inside of uh, the community overall and something that I have seen inside of Swift as well. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But as a high-level summary, Swift is an object storage engine. It is built for scale. It's optimized for durability, availability, and concurrency across the entire data set. Uh, it is, uh, my vision for Swift is that everyone will use it every day, even if they don't realize it. Uh, we see this uh, in, uh, in a lot of places. It's, uh, Swift is perfect for unstructured data that can grow without bounds, uh, things like uh, uh, content generated and consumed by web and mobile apps, backups, documents, videos, pictures, that kind of stuff. I want to see people uh, using Swift when they're helping their kids with their homework by looking stuff up online. I want to see people using Swift when they're filing expense reports, when they're checking their bank balance, when they're watching videos uh, online. All of that kind of stuff are places that are great for Swift and, in fact, where Swift is being used today. So my overview is a summary of what's going on in the community. It's not dates or schedules. It's more of a reflection of conversations that are happening. And so that's, that's kind of what I want to share with you. So uh, looking at who's going on in the community, uh, first just kind of an update of the community side of things before we get into the technical piece. Uh, Who's participating in the community? I think is always an interesting question. And so we still have the the, the most prolific and active uh, daily contributors into Swift these days are uh, are familiar names in the community: uh, SwiftStack, Red Hat, HP, Rackspace, Intel. Uh, all uh, all of whom are contributing into uh, keeping Swift healthy and uh, pushing it into new directions. And it's a really solid base of contributors, and I'm proud to work with them. They, all of them are uh, really solid, uh, strong uh, contributors uh, technically and uh, strategically. And it's, it's just a, it's a pleasure to work with these companies and to see uh, both what they're doing uh, in the marketplace, but also how they're, um, how they're bringing their varied expertise and uh, experience of different use cases into the uh, development community itself. And so that's been really excited. Uh, exciting uh, for me to uh, to see uh, continue in uh, in this uh, recently and then going forward in the community. So what's next? What else, what are we seeing? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, I think something that's really kind of cool is that we're seeing a lot more uptick and things that I'm hearing are a lot uh, more of Swift being used and supported by third-party ecosystem apps. These, uh, I, I, work for, uh, I work for Swift Stack and I have inter interactions uh, with people in the ecosystem quite a bit. And the thing that I am hearing uh, unprompted from people is that there's basically two object storage APIs that matter today, uh, S3 and Swift. And that is something that's really tremendously exciting. And you know, I was talking about that the kilogram is a, is a standard that people adhere to. And I think what we're seeing also is the OpenStack APIs as a standard, beyond what we like to tell ourselves internally in the community, but actually hearing feedback from people who are not involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, minutia of OpenStack itself, but actually just looking at this from a, a very broad ecosystem perspective. We're seeing OpenStack APIs uh, become supported as uh, first-class citizens. And so one of the things, um, a few things that I guess are very interesting I've seen recently is looking at major applications like Commvault and Veeam uh, that are used in very large enterprises today, um, supporting Swift as a first-class citizen. Uh, Storage Made Easy is uh, one that has been adding a lot of great support recently. Uh, Gladinet, in fact, I just saw this morning, uh, announced uh, a, a tighter partnership with Helion Swift. Uh, and that's in addition to kind of some of the old favorites uh, that have been in the ecosystem for a while, like CyberDuck and Expand Drive. And of course, there's a ton of people using uh, Swift internally uh, for internal apps. They're writing their apps to talk directly to Swift. And so this is really kind of cool because what we're seeing is that Swift is becoming the thing that people are talking to for object storage. And this is because we're, well, I guess, because and as a result of this both, we're seeing more, more and larger clusters of Swift in the overall uh, installed base. Uh, this drives uh, demand for some of those more traditional enterprise features. Uh, and it, of course, uh, means that people need things like more automation. And I'll touch on some of these kind of things that we're talking about in a little bit. And so in addition to that, in addition to these uh, third-party client apps, but I think part of the same story is that we're also seeing in the, e in the community uh, more integration and interest from other storage providers, uh, both with a native integration using Swift's extensibility points to integrate natively, uh, but also uh, their own support of the Swift API. And so all of that is very interesting, looking at both who's contributing into the community, but then also the very large ecosystem about people who are uh, building applications and products and, and businesses around Swift itself and based on Swift as a standard object storage uh, API and implementation that can store uh, the data that people are using for applications today. And so that actually leads me to an interesting uh, new development that we've got in the community right now. How do clients interact with Swift? So we have been talking about uh, how to make things better for applications that are using Swift. And a lot of times the very first interaction that people have with Swift is using the official command line interface, the CLI, or the official Python uh, uh, development toolkit called the SDK. And so these things are part of the code base that we maintain as, as a Swift project inside of OpenStack. And so we've decided to make some changes in uh, some of our direction of what we're going forward here. Uh, they're kind of a, a long-term uh, effort. Uh, first off, the CLI is something that we are going to continue to keep and maintain and add features to and fix bugs in and add additional polish to and all of that. Uh, it's something that is a very useful tool for a lot of people to be able to uh, interact very easily from a command line uh, with a Swift, a Swift storage endpoint. The CLI uses the SDK. That is the Python wrapper to the OpenStack API, uh, a Swift API. The API itself is simply using HTTP, so standard uh, HTTP verbs and response codes. But we've got a higher level uh, wrapper around that written in, in, in Python that allows people to um, uh, interact with it programmatically a little more easily. 
and uh, the command line interface makes use of those tools. Now, the, there, is, there has been an effort inside of the OpenStack community to create a single OpenStack SDK project to give all of the OpenStack projects a more unified SDK and then uh, a single place where people can, uh, a single library that people can consume that can then talk to all of the OpenStack projects. It's very early, especially for their implementation uh, and their support of Swift right now. But it's rather a uh, fortuitous time for, for us to uh, very closely work together, so the, the Swift community and the OpenStack SDK uh, team. And so what we're looking at and what we're talking about right now is taking uh, any effort for future features and uh, in a new directions and, and rewrites and things like that of the uh, Python Swift Client SDK. And instead of focusing it there, we will um, focus on the new work that's being done inside of OpenStack SDK. What this allows us to do is make things a little more efficient uh, and uh, take the knowledge that we've developed over the last four or five years of writing Python OpenStack, uh, the Python Swift Client SDK, and uh, taking those lessons and doing it right, or doing it at least better uh, this time, so that we can focus on things a little bit uh, more like efficiency and, and performance and, and stuff like that. So since these guys are uh, essentially starting from scratch, and we, wanted, we realized that to do all of these major changes, we'd essentially have to start from scratch, we figured out uh, that it would be a really good opportunity to work closely together to, uh, to share, the, share the workload, but also uh, make something that's pretty cool. So this is a long-term uh, ongoing effort. Uh, it is something that uh, is, again, uh, it's not a particular schedule or timeline or something like that, but it's more of a, a general conversation we're having inside of the community. Um, we, of course, are going to be uh, very focused on uh, maintaining compatibility and making sure that existing applications that uh, do not break, and we're not abandoning Python, OpenStack, uh, Python Swift Client right now at all. So we will continue to improve that. We'll continue to uh, make sure that bugs are fixed, uh, especially on the CLI side. But on the SDK side, we're going to uh, look at uh, putting some more effort behind the OpenStack SDK project. So that's a change there um, that, that we're working on. And that's going to affect uh, some, some things going forward um, as far as how clients interact with that. So what else is next? Uh, there's an else next slide, please. Um, there's another. Uh, open source heavy group uh, called the GNOME Foundation, and they have an outreach program, which is kind of an, it's, it's an internship program. And it's something that is designed to get underrepresented groups involved in open source. So it's a really, uh, it's a really great goal and uh, something that I'm really happy to say that OpenStack has been a part of in the past and has continued to uh, invest uh, time and effort into. Uh, for the current round of the outreach, GNOME Outreach Program, OpenStack has six interns uh, participating across the, the various OpenStack projects. And one of those interns is working on Swift and is focusing on uh, improving some operational tools. And it's something that is really just a, I'm really happy that it's happening. And uh, um, our, our intern for inside of Swift is jumped in and has uh, already made some contributions into Swift, and uh, will continue to uh, add in some uh, tools uh, specifically designed to uh, do some uh, operational checking to validate uh, OpenStack deployment or Swift deployments just to make sure that um, everything is working well. So. That being said, as far as where the community is and uh, who's working on what and uh, the kind of the ecosystem around it and the little changes we're making on the Swift client, I want to uh, go a little bit into a new process that we have uh, called Specs and what that is meaning for uh, how that's been framing the conversations uh, that we've been working on. So Specs are uh, basically a collaborative design process for bigger features within Swift. There are several uh, parts of the, several different projects inside of OpenStack that have adopted uh, some sort of specs process. And it's, it's something that is kind of caught on like wildfire, but 
uh, I think it's very early in figuring out how, do this, how does this process actually work. And so it's good to think that this is, this is an experiment. The goal here is to increase communication. The goal is not to have another process to do something. So this is, gonna, this is kind of our second try at making a specs process for Swift that is effective and works. And so our current thing that we're talking about uh, that we're using inside of this integrated release cycle is to, when, when a spec is proposed, we want to iterate and land on those, uh, land those specs very quickly. We're not going to look for this big design document up front that has every possible contingency and, and use case and uh, corner case defined and and, uh, and explore it out. What we want to do is we want to uh, have it as a way to improve communication, especially when people are working across different companies, across different time zones, and things like that. So we want to be able to um, we want to land things fast as soon as we can agree on something, and we want to keep those updated as we iterate on our conversations and figure out what the best way going forward is. And as the coding happens, so once we agree on this is a thing that we think we should do then um, when coding starts, we want to keep the spec updated based on our um, – keep the spec updated based on what the implementation actually does. So another point of this is that specs are not docs. Docs are different. They have a different audience. Specs are designed for the communication. So that being said, what are some of the things that we're talking about? So next slide. What are actually – uh, what's actually going on inside of the community? What's being worked on? What are what are these conversations? These collaborative conversations that were actually happening? Well, one of the first ones is a big one that we've been talking about quite a bit. Erasure codes. We have a major feature that landed uh, in uh, several months ago inside of Swift called storage policies. Storage policies allow you to configure how that is stored inside of your uh, inside of your cluster in a very uh, fine granular level. One of the things that we can build on top of that is to be able to actually uh, configure how your data is stored across the set of hardware. So today we use replication, and then we're building the feature uh, to allow you to do erasure codes on top of uh, inside of your Swift cluster alongside of replication. So the data that needs to be stored that way can be. So what's the status? This uh, this is a little screenshot of the status, our, our current Trello board status uh, as of last night. Um, basically, the progress is good. We are working very hard, and lots of people, lots of different companies are constantly talking about this. Um, we are uh, getting something that's going to be demoable very, very soon. And uh, a lot of the work that's uh, been done up to this point has been spent on some very hard design problems and making sure that we have these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, fundamental problems uh, figured out before we start doing some of the more uh, demoable things like, oh, well, let's just read and write the data up front. So one of the hard problems that we're figuring out that we're planning on being able to support as of this point is the ability to overwrite uh, objects that have been stored uh, as erasure coded. Uh, data. This uh, doesn't sound like a very hard problem, but when you think about the fact that the different components uh, that make up the erasure coded object uh, are in fact stored across a lot of different pieces of different physical hardware, the coordination problem becomes rather tricky uh, when figuring out, well, what is the actual uh, instance or version of the object that you are actually trying to keep and maintain and, and know that that's going to be your durable copy. So that's a hard problem that we're trying to figure out. And it's complicated by the fact that uh, Swift does not have the concept of a global lock. So you can't lock the cluster down or even lock a particular object down and, um, and say, okay, well now we're going to have something that's going to be a, basically an atomic operation or even just a, a, an operation inside of a transaction that's, that you can roll back. That doesn't actually work inside of Swift as, as a distributed system. So um, we've got to figure out how do we make, make progress on this and allow the uh, erasure coded objects to have the same semantics as replicated objects uh, from a client perspective? So we're working really hard on this, and these are some very tricky problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and it's going to be done when it's done. 
This is our top priority inside of our current integrated release cycle. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty uh, confident that we're going to have something uh, that's pretty cool pretty soon. Next slide. One of the other big things uh, that we have seen inside of the communities, one of the other conversations, um, especially coming from some of those big customers, you know, talking about some more of these enterprise features, is the concept of encryption. And encryption is, especially when you're talking about storage, has it's a very loaded word that has a, as soon as you say it, a lot of people assume they know exactly what you're talking about. The problem is there's a lot of different use cases that can be wrapped up in this concept of encryption. So uh, what we're talking about right now and what uh, we're hearing from users and looking at um, the thing that people need to solve first is solving the problem of basically if a hard drive walks out of my, my cluster, um, either maliciously or inadvertently, I need to make sure that nobody can read the data that is stored on it. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. And uh, right now we've got uh, some very interested users and customers for this, uh, some active conversations, including a, a very active spec document uh, being worked on right now as far as here's how we can have a framework uh, by which we can implement uh, encryption, uh, which means uh, encryption at rest, the data at rest. Um, for data stored inside of Swift, and something that will work for different use cases um, that will uh, not uh, be too complicated, but also not be too limiting uh, for people who need to do this. So it's something that uh, is, again, an active conversation inside the community. Uh, next up. Next up is this thing uh, called composite tokens. It has, it's an auth, um, it's new functionality to work with auth systems. Basically, the idea uh, in here is uh, that we have some data inside of Swift that may be put there by a, a service. So in this sense, especially looking at a, a broader OpenStack deployment, you could imagine that somebody has, is using OpenStack Compute and then using OpenStack uh, Image Service to store these images inside of Swift. So uh, you don't necessarily, though, want to have uh, the end user be able to delete those images without going through some other process because that could uh, make some things inconsistent with, with the whole index and, and everything like that. So you still need to be able to track it, and you need to have appropriate permissions on it. But um, and, and then on the other hand, you don't necessarily want the system itself to uh, make uh, decisions on the behalf of the user. Um, so the, the, the proposal here is to require for uh, certain uh, levels of permission that the operation requires two auth tokens, one from the service and one from the end user. So this is called composite tokens, and uh, it's something that has been uh, worked on inside of Keystone, and there's very active discussions happening inside of Swift, although there's not any code in Swift uh, for that right now. So next up. Next up is something that we call fast post. Post is an HTTP verb, and inside of Swift it's used to uh, modify metadata uh, for objects. And in almost all cases uh, right now, it is inside of Swift, it's implemented as a copy. So you send a little bit of metadata, and the system will read the old data and then write out the new data with your new piece of metadata. So that works pretty well, especially since in most use cases, posts aren't, you, aren't done very frequently. Unfortunately, it makes it a rather expensive operation. So fast post is um, something that uh, is, is an improvement on that so that we do not have to do that, uh, that server-side copy. Uh, this is something that uh, there's a lot of historical reasons for why we're doing what we're doing, uh, but suffice to say, uh, it's something that there are some active uh, patches and reviews going in right now to um, see if we can get rid of that server-side copy so that we can make post operations very, very fast. And that's uh, something that's, again, just uh, along the lines of continued efficiency improvements that we always like to look at for Swift. Which brings me, actually, to kind of the general catch-all uh, next topic here, which is we're working on efficiency improvements inside of Swift. This is something we always want to 
uh, keep our eye on, uh, especially as people are storing more and more data and having more and more users on this. Uh, if you remember, Swift is, is designed for massive scale, massive concurrency across uh, the entire data set. So we have to make sure that we're the things that we're doing, uh, we're not doing too much, and we're not uh, doing them too slowly. So uh, there's a few things that kind of go under this right now in addition to the fast post feature. Uh, some of the stuff that we're talking about, some people are uh, playing with, and again, some conversations that are happening right now uh, involve uh, making uh, very, very large containers more efficient. Uh, there's some improvements that I'm pretty excited about that are along the lines of improving efficiency in global replication. So if you have regions that are uh, separated by a continent or separated by an ocean, making that a little bit more efficient. Um, and then overall, we're of course just continuing to uh, fix bugs, make, make it easier for end users and operators. Um, this even comes back to the current project that our uh, outreach, GNOME Outreach Program intern is working on, uh, making sure that we've got some operator tools that really allow you just to validate your cluster very simply. Um, so something we always want to keep our mind on, and again, there's lots of conversations with that. So, would you like to get involved? That is, if you would like to get involved, you're more than welcome. We would love to have you help out um, and, and come on in. Uh, you can get involved. Uh, the best way is uh, hang out in the OpenStack-Swift IRC channel on the Freenode IRC network. Uh, there's a lot of people there in a lot of different time zones, so generally any time of the day or night you should be able to find uh, answers to your questions and figure out how to get involved. Uh, we even have a wiki page uh, that has just some lightweight ideas of, hey, here's something that we don't even really have any detail around it, but somebody's mentioned it more than once, and it would just be kind of a cool thing to work on. So this is even a kind of a good place if, if you'd like to uh, play around with some things and you don't have your own idea of what to work on already, this is a good place to a good list to start with. And then if you'd like to uh, begin coding and, and uh, get involved with actually uh, making the code itself better, fixing bugs, adding features, things like that. Uh, the best way to uh, get installed uh, with a, uh, a dev environment is using the link provided here. Uh, it's a Swift all-in-one environment that can be very simply provisioned uh, with VirtualBox and Vagrant. So we would love to have you come along. We have weekly meetings. Uh, those you can find in IRC. Uh, also, you feel free to contact me, uh, Twitter, email, IRC. Uh, and I try to respond to as much of that as I can. Um, and that's what we have. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. And Allison, thank you for having me today. Awesome. Thanks, John. And those links that he has in his presentation will also be below in the um, YouTube description. So again, if you'd like to get involved, please visit those links and contact John if you have any questions. And that is it for today's um, overview. Again, please reach out to any of our PTLs online today, David, Owen, or John, if you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about how to get involved. Thank you.